Hello, everyone. This is Dory Clark, and we are here with our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better. This week's guest is the wonderful Ruth Gotian. Ruth is the author of the brand new book, hot off the press this week. It's called The Success Factor, in which she reverse engineers the secrets of success of some of the world's greatest performers in all fields. Ruth, it's so great to have you here. Dory, my friend, I am so excited that we are chatting. Me too, and congratulations on the publication of your first book. This is fantastic. And for all of you who are tuning in live, please feel free to type into the chat box and let us know who you are, where you are dialing in from, and questions that you have for Ruth, who has now been analyzing in great depth what it takes to be successful and to be a peak performer. So Ruth, a question that I have about this issue, you know, how do, how do we develop the mindset for peak performance? How do we actually rise to the top of our fields? So you have been analyzing this, this kind of cross field look at succeeding as a, as a performer, whether that is a Nobel prize winning scientist or an Olympian on the surface, these se seem like pretty different activities, but it sounds like you've actually found commonalities in terms of who they are and what they do. Can you actually talk a little bit more about that and what that looks like? Absolutely. Dory, I have been obsessed with success for so long that at the age of 43, I decided to go back to school and get my doctorate and really take a deep dive into it. And that's when the whole thing started. And it actually started when I was studying physician scientists. And over the years, it expanded to those astronauts and Nobel Prize winners and Olympic champions and CEOs. And what I quickly realized was that the four elements of success that I found with the physician scientists and the Nobel Prize winners were the same four elements I found in the astronauts and Olympians. So can you imagine that a Nobel Prize winning scientist is just like an Olympic champion figure skater, exactly the same. They all do the same four things and they do all of those four things in tandem. And that's oh when God, I you understood. Gotta tell us. What are yes. they, Ruth? <laughs> well, that's when I understood that you can actually learn how to be successful. So you ready for the first one? Hit us. You ready? All right. The first thing is you need to find your passion and purpose. Now, I don't mean you find your passion, you'll never work a day in your life. It's deeper than that, much deeper than that. This is why you were put on this earth. This is why you wake up in the morning with the bounce and you can't quiet your head at night. So for example, that Nobel Prize winning scientist, before they ever got to that work, maybe someone in their family suffered from cancer and they know what that devastation is like. And they also really like science. So they decided to commit themselves to trying to find a treatment for cancer. This is all about what we call intrinsic motivation. It's not about the prize, the promotion, the award, because if it was, they would have quit doing it as soon as they won the Nobel. And I don't know of a single Nobel Prize winning scientist who quit after getting the big prize. So don't worry about those extrinsic things when other people are judging you. Get it from inside, that intrinsic motivation. That's the first one. Ready for two, Dory? Oh my goodness. We cannot wait. <laughs> Telephone number two is Ruth. <laughs> Number two is their work ethic, their perseverance, their tenacity, their grit, whatever word you want to use. They're going to outwork everyone, but they're going to work, as you talk about quite a bit in your book, in the long game, they're going to work smarter, not just harder. They find their peak performance hours and they leverage that. So for example, if I'm a morning person and I wake up before the sunrise, I'm going to do my deep work then. I'm not going to put in deep work on my calendar during remnants of time, I'm actually going to do it when I am more productive and focused and can get into a state of flow. And then I leave all of the passive tasks, the Zooms, the responding to emails, when I'm a little slower. And that's usually in the late afternoon. So it's also the way they look at challenges. Some people may be faced with the challenge and they throw their hands up and they say, that's it. I can't deal with this pandemic. I'm just binging Netflix. But other people will say, here's a problem I have. What is the strategy I need to overcome the challenge? It's never a question of if they'll overcome the challenge. They know that they will. Instead, they focus on how to overcome the challenge. What is that strategy that I haven't thought of yet? That's number two. 
Whoa, I love it. And Ruth, <laughs> before you go into numbers three and four, which we're eager to hear, I just want to say hello to some of the great folks who are tuning in to join us. We're so glad we have great viewers tuning in. We have Helene from New York. We have Denise from California. We have a LinkedIn user from New York. Adedoyen is here. We have Cheryl from Minneapolis. St. Paul Debbie is here from outside New York. Hey there. Um, Myra is here from Milwaukee. We've got a LinkedIn user from Florida, one from, uh, from Denver. We've got Kurt tuning in. Uh, uh, we've got Anand, we've got William in Denver, uh, or Liam, sorry, from Denver. Uh, Eugenia is here from Costa Rica. We're so glad to have all of you and more. If you have questions about how to reverse engineer top peak performance, feel free to ask any of your questions to Ruth Gotian, who is our guest. She is the author of the new book, The Success Factor. We are talking about how we can actually get the right mindset and the right practices for being a top performer. And if you're enjoying this conversation, hit the like button and hit the share button so that your colleagues can benefit from Ruth's insights. All right, Ruth, hit us. What is what is success secret number three that, that transcends your actual field of practice? It is success secret number three for both Olympic athletes and Nobel winning scientists. What do you got? All of them. Number three is you need to build a really strong foundation and constantly reinforce it. What you did early in your career, you're going to do later in your career. One of the people who I interviewed was Neil Katyal. Neil Katyal argued 45 cases before the Supreme Court of the United States. That's more than any other minority lawyer in America. Fun I asked fact, him, I, I rented, I rent, I was the tenant who took over uh, his sister's lease in uh, the summer of 1995. <laughs> That's right. So me and Neil are like that. <laughs> like this, right? <laughs> it's always such a small world, right? <laughs> and I asked Neil, I said, Neil, what do you do in order to prepare for your cases before the Supreme Court? Because most people, most lawyers don't even argue one. He's argued 45. He said, I do three things. I prepare a binder with every question that I might get asked. And I bring that binder with all of the answers to the courtroom. And he said, Ruth, I've never opened up that binder in any one of the cases, but just preparing it helped me prepare for the case. Number two is he holds moot courts. These are simulated court sessions. He did 15 of them early on in his career. Now he's still doing them. He did, now he does five. And last but not least, the night before the opening arguments, he goes into his kid's bedroom and instead of a bedtime story, they get to hear the opening arguments of the case to the Supreme Court of the United States, <laughs> because if it's clear enough for children, it's going to be clear enough for the Supreme Court. So he does all three of those for case one through case 45. He hasn't changed his practice at all. Same thing. Athletes are the same. Any warm up that you would see an NBA star or an Olympian doing, you would see in any junior high gym. Ryan Millar is a three-time Olympian. He won the gold medal at the Olympics in Beijing. And he told me the most important thing, and this guy is a giant, six foot, I don't know, something, towers over me. And he said, the most important thing is not how high you can jump or how you can block, it's ball control. I said, okay. And he said, the warm-ups before any practice in the games at the Olympics is a technique called pepper, which works on ball control. He said that was the same thing he did in his backyard when he was seven years old with his brother. Pepper, same thing. Hasn't changed in all the years just because he became better and an Olympian. So that's three. Oh my goodness. This is this is great. You're, leave, you're leaving us with a cliffhanger. We want to hear success factor number four, but first we want to say hi to Christine who's joining us. We have Mayada from Dallas. Uh, Anand is joining from India. Inez from Germany. Nathaniel's here from Austin. Monica from Colombia. We've got a LinkedIn friend from New Jersey. Isan is from Iran. We've got Justina from Poland. We've got Neil from Brighton, UK. Uh, so, so many friends tuning in. We're glad to have you here. If you want to make sure that you learn more about Ruth Gotian and her work, just check it out at ruthgotian.com. And if you want to make sure you never miss one of our LinkedIn uh, Newsweek live streams, which happens every Thursday, same same bat time, same bat channel, it's 9 uh, a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern. What I will suggest is you can go to doryclark.com slash L-I, that stands for LinkedIn. You can follow me on LinkedIn, subscribe to my LinkedIn newsletter, and you will get reminders. All right, we want to take your questions about success 
success and how to reverse engineer peak performance. For Ruth Gautier, yes. I see some great questions coming in already. But before we tackle them, Ruth, number four, what is success secret number four of the world's top performers? Number four. Have you ever heard of Mark Cuban and Bill Gates and Warren Buffett? Heard of those people? I have heard of those people. Yes. <laughs> They are some of the biggest billionaires that we have, and they are notorious for reading three to eight hours a day. Now, I'm like you. I love reading. I read 70 to 100 books a year. So to me, reading three to eight hours sounds wonderful. But most people, they either don't like to read, they don't have three to eight hours a day, and that's okay because reading is not what made Cuban and Gates and Buffett billionaires. It's not reading. It's opening their mind up to new knowledge and making connections that other people don't see and utilizing something from one industry, flipping it on its head and bringing it to another industry. That's innovation. So it's all about opening your mind up for new knowledge. So what are some of the ways that we can do that? We can certainly read books. We can read articles. I know that you write a ton for, H for Harvard Business Review and a bunch of other publications podcasts are great. Webinars are great. LinkedIn Lives like this one, hopefully we're sharing some good stuff with everyone. TED Talks, LinkedIn Learning Courses, which I know we both have. There's so many other ways that you can open your mind up to new knowledge and think about things and make start making connections. But in order to do that, you need to surround yourself with interesting people. And you can also talk about ideas. And one of the things that all of these people had, the astronauts, the Nobel Prize winners, the Olympians, they surrounded themselves with not just one, but a team of mentors who believed in them more than they believed in themselves. So you need to do all those four things and have a team of mentors around you. Those are the four uh -oh. elements of success. <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh. That's the quick primer. I, I love it. <laughs> Ruth Gotian, author of The Success Factor. This is fantastic. So we have some great questions coming in from our audience. And, and Ruth, I wanted to go to this one first. Simone wants to know, what is your take on talent? And I, I am imagining that, that part of what she means is perhaps there is you know, the perennial discussion about, oh, if you're, if you're the world's best, if you're a top performer, are you born that way? I mean, obviously you have to, you have to work, you know, you can't right. uh, just post in, but what is, what is the role? Can theoretically anyone who's, you know, got some talent actually emerge to become the world's top performer or in re in reality, are we actually talking about people who really are exceptionally gifted, plus they worked hard? How do you think about this talent uh, and kind of genetics equation? I think it's actually much more than that. I think anybody can be successful. I also believe that the definition of success changes based on who you ask. I also believe that success is a moving target. And some people are never satisfied. There's always something more that they want to achieve. Now, my original research actually looked to define success because we don't have a definition for it, really. And one of the things that I realized was that that definition changes based on hierarchy and gender. But the definition that I used in the success factor, it was really made up of people who created a paradigm shift in their field. They change the way we do things, think about things, process things. That is the shift that they made. They also, as they were moving up the ranks, they were bringing other people up with them. They shared that, that knowledge. They shared that wisdom. They shared the spotlight. And also, these people realize that, that they have a recognition for their work. People are know them as this is the go-to person. Now, Realize, I never said you need to win the Nobel Prize. I never said you need to win an Olympic medal. So one of the Otherwise people who I interviewed. A failure. <laughs> that would be hardly, unfortunate. <laughs> hardly, hardly. I mean, one of the people who I interviewed was Devin Harris. Devin Harris, if you ever saw the movie Cool Runnings about the Jamaican bobsledding team, Devin was one of the original members of the Jamaican bobsledding team. Their goal was not to get a medal. Their goal was to get in the Olympics. And then the goal was to get in there again. And then a third time, right? Because they come from a tropical island. They don't even have the, the elements to practice. So the definition is very, very different. But I use those, those three mark markers, create a paradigm shift, 
be recognized in your field, which I know is something you work on quite a bit and teach others, and also bring other people up as you start to ascend in your notoriety. That's great, Ruth. Thank you so much. We have new friends tuning in. Margaret's here from, from Ghana. We've got uh, Sayed from Iran. We've got Carlos tuning in from Colombia and many more. And so I'm curious, for those of you who are tuning in, perhaps you can actually type into the chat box. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to learn from you. What is your top success tip for the success that you have achieved in your life? What would you say is the practice that has best enabled it for you? We'd love to learn from your experiences. So type that into the chat box. And in the meantime, Ruth, Dean has a question for you. You have interviewed a lot of people for, for this book. This is pretty comprehensive. Um, yeah, I'm not even sure you can tell us how many people you interviewed, but uh, give us a sense of the breadth of folks? And then who was your favorite? Who stands out as being most interesting or, or most meaningful to you that you spoke with? So, hey, Dean, um, he, I have interviewed hundreds of people for this. Uh, there are 61 who are featured in the book. It's everyone from Nobel Prize winners, uh, Dr. Bob Lefkowitz, and then Michael Brown, um, astronauts, um, Dr. Peggy Whitson, who is the former chief astronaut of NASA, um, Apollo Ono, the most decorated winter Olympian, uh, Dr. Tony Fauci, who we all know uh, as an infectious we've, we've disease We've heard of expert. him, yeah. You heard of him? <laughs> um, and CEOs, and I saw someone who's here from Denver, so I have the Attorney General from Colorado is in the book. Um, the former CEO of Build-A-Bear Workshop and of Snapfish, they're in the book. So it really is a, a diverse, really a diverse group. Oh, that's that's great. And uh, and who did you say your favorite was? Oh, my favorite. Um, there are two that really stood out for very, very different reasons. The first one is Dr. Peggy Whitson, NASA's former chief astronaut. She actually was working for NASA and she applied to be an astronaut. But for 10 years, she was turned down, 10 years, and she kept reapplying. Eventually, she got accepted, and it's a good thing because she became the first female commander of the International Space Station, a role she held twice. She became NASA's chief astronaut, and she holds the record for more days in space than any American astronaut. This is someone who was turned down for 10 years. Can you imagine if she quit? Can you imagine with the hole we would have in our knowledge and the, the way we do things? So I am very thankful that Dr. Peggy Whitson didn't quit. That's number one. Number two, um, I always ask Olympians to show me their medals. And we talk about which is their favorite, et cetera. So I thought they would all have a trophy room where they would all have them on display. And it turns out they don't. One has it under the bed, one has it in the safe, one has it in the nightstand. Apollo Ono had it in a brown paper bag in his sock drawer. I thought that was hysterical because I, I would wear it around my neck to vacuum. So, But I, I asked them about that because I thought that was really a common theme throughout all of them. And I said, I don't understand. Why don't you have your trophies and medals on display? And they were very clear. And they said it was never about the medal. It was about the journey. And that's why they, they told me that the medal was a chapter in their lives, not the entire story. And that's why they didn't crumble after they won that medal. They always had a next goal that they were striving for. And that's, I think, a beautiful story and a beautiful idea to keep in mind. Yeah, that's really powerful. Thank you, Ruth. We're here again with Ruth Gautian. She's the author of the new book, The Success Factor. And folks have been typing in great observations and ideas about how they have personally become successful. I love this. We have uh, Nathaniel saying, understanding where your sweet spot on the stress curve is uh, so that you're not overstressed or understressed. Carlos is talking about, you know, making strategic choices. Cheryl is mentioning defending time for what matters to you personally. Uh, Javier is talking about resiliency and thinking long-term. Love these. And Ruth, a question that I have for you is now that you've spent this time interviewing 60 plus top performers, what changes have you made in your own life? Now, now that you've been exposed to all this wisdom, I'm assuming that you've implemented some of it. What does that look like for you on a day-to-day -day basis? Dory, I was patient zero with this. Once I started seeing these themes that come up 
and I really wanted to test if these were learned skills, mm -hmm. I actually tried them out on myself first. I don't think we would be talking if it didn't work. I don't think the book, The Success Factor, ever would have happened if it doesn't work. So I tell people I tried it on myself. I tried it with everyone I work with. And the difference was just almost immediate, which is what's so great. And the other part with the book that I'm so pleased with is I don't just tell you what to do. I'm an adult educator. So I can't tell you what to do without teaching you how to actually do it. So the whole last third of the book is all about implementation and how instead of talking about one day I'm going to do this and one day I'm going to do that, instead of one day, you can make today day one. And the whole book is a blueprint how to do it. Oh, my gosh. Well, give us one specific example, Ruth, of okay, something that you've implemented or changed. Oh, can you still hear me? Lost your sound. Okay, that's fascinating. I, um, boy, can can other people hear me at all, uh, or did that just die for some reason? No, not happening. Okay, all right. All right, can you hear him now? Is this doing anything? No, I'll be right back. Hmm. Right back. Well, I, hopefully you guys can hear me while Dory is trying to figure out um, her sound. Um, I wasn't able to hear her, but I'm hoping all of you can. Oh, hi, I'm back. Can you hear me now? Is this working? I can't hear. No, okay, okay. I That's Interpretive Fast. dance for people. Okay, good. We got it. Oh, thank God. All right. Fantastic. Hi, everyone. Thanks for your patience. We're just trying a different mic. It's, we're just rocking it. It's great. That's that's the nature and the beauty of live. Okay. Ruth Gotian, the author of The Success Factor, we want to hear from you. One of the things that you talk about in your book is the concept of a passion audit. What the heck is this and why do we need to do one? It seems like everyone can hear Dory except for me. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, uh, let me try this. What is a passion audit, Ruth? I didn't mean to the chat box for you. Well, so, okay. Ruth Gotian having some trouble here with the audio. But she is the author of The Success Factor, which is a fantastic book talking about the best practices and principles of how you can become more successful. And so you guys have been typing in great examples and stories about this. I will actually just say, and as Ruth is, uh, is figuring all this out, and hopefully uh, in the chat box, she will see the question that I have been uh, typing in. But... I will talk about uh, some of the practices that I use. And if you can actually type in those in the studio audience, uh, tuning in and listening, what, um, what your best habits are, especially morning habits, that would be great. But I will say one of the things that I have done recently is I have actually uh, bought a place in Miami. This is where I am now. And part of it has been for me a strategy to really try to focus on uh, health better. And so I have begun at, uh, at the suggestion of my doctor, three minute planks every day for core strength, which is honestly, it's terrible. I really hate doing three minute planks, but I understand from talking to him that, uh, that core strength, it, this, this is sort of one of the great challenges that so many professionals have because of all of the sitting that we do. And so if we are able to focus on that, that it, it's not sexy, right? It's not like, you know, you get the big biceps or something like that, but it's one of the foundational elements. So three minute planks has been uh, something that albeit painful, I have been making a commitment to doing. I see that Javier is talking about walking meditation, which is really fantastic. And uh, Mark is doing 30 push-ups. That's fantastic. All right. I love it. And, uh, and so, uh, Ruth, why don't we go ahead and hear from you about the passion audit? 
Sure. Okay. I'm glad we, we have the sound figured out. Don't know what happened. Yes. The passion audit. Remember I told you, you need to do all four things at the same time, but if you were going to start with one, I strongly recommend figuring out what your passion and purpose is. And the passion audit is something that I actually recommend that people do. And it really starts with a three column exercise to figure out what it is that you're good at, what it is that you enjoy doing. What are you good at, but you don't enjoy doing? What are you not good at? What depletes you? What do you do on your weekends? What do you do for free? So actually the book, The Success Factor, actually has online resources that people can download because it was very important to me that I turn one day into day one for people. And really this passion audit is really a five minute exercise that asks you some targeted questions to figure out what it is that, that will really give you that fire in the belly. And then we're going to work on pouring gasoline on it so that you can leverage it and really improve your success. That's awesome. I, I love that, Ruth. Thank you for, for sharing that. Passion audit sounds great. I, I wanted to pick up on a theme that you had mentioned. You had alluded earlier to the importance of having a mentor or group of mentors. Yeah. But I know that there's a lot of professionals out there who say, that sounds nice, Ruth. Where do I get a mentor? Easier said than done. What is your advice for people who agree with you, who think this is a great idea, but just are really not sure how to get started? Yeah, in fact, 76% of people understand the need for one, but only 30 37% actually have a mentor. But those who have it actually out earn and outperform those who don't have a mentor. And there's so many ways that you can find not one. Remember, I advocate for having a team of mentors from very, very diverse fields. And it really starts by putting yourself in a place where you are around interesting people. Now, when you meet these interesting people, don't come with an ask because the second you ask them to mentor you, that's going to sound like another job to them and they don't have time right? And I know you are very big on that as well. And you talk about that in your, in your book as well, because really nobody has time for that. And that word actually scares people. But if you ask them for their perspective, or can I grab 15 minutes, I'm working on a project and really curious about your thoughts about this, if I'm headed in the right direction, that, pe that people will do. In fact, they'll be excited to do it. Now, there is always something that you can offer the mentor. I don't care how senior they are, there's always something that you can offer them before you ever ask for anything. And I actually advocate for having three levels of mentors on your mentoring team. You want those senior people for sure. You also want people who are junior to you because they're looking at things through different colored glasses than the rest of us. And they have very different perspectives and you wanna make sure that you are not archaic in your thinking. So you definitely want people who are junior to you you also want people at your level, peer mentors or who I call friend tours, because these are the people you will rise together. You are not going to be junior forever. And in fact, the friend tours who I talk about in the success factor are Dr. Lynn Wooten at Simmons University up in Boston and her best friend and mentor, Dr. Erica James, who's the Dean at Wharton. One's the president of a university, the other is a Dean. And they are best friends and they mentor each other. And they met as 20-something year olds, grad students at the University of Michigan. Now one's a dean and one's a president, but peers rise together. So you want to put yourself around interesting people, ask for perspective, try to offer before you ever take. And don't worry about titles and labels. That comes much later. Such good advice. We've been talking with Ruth Gotian. She's the author of The Success Factor. You can learn more about Ruth at ruthgotian.com. Ruth, we have time for one more speed round question. And a great one came in from Gabriel. He says, I think that discipline is one of the most important factors. So how do you think that discipline actually factors in to, to the success factor? What's, what's the role here? Is this uh, you know, obviously it's important, but is, is it essential? How would you rate this in the scale of things that one needs to be cultivating, Ruth? Absolutely. And that's part of the second element of success, part of that work ethic. Because when you love what you're doing, you are not going to drop your pen at five o'clock just because the day is over. You have the discipline to see the job done. Nobody has to push you to do it. You want to do it. 
Remember, this is why you were put on this earth. So you have the discipline to do it. And that has to come because you love what you're doing. Remember I told you about Apollo Ono and his medals in the sock drawer? He was actually a state champion swimmer before he ever started speed skating. But he didn't love the swimming, so he didn't want to put the work in. But speed skating, he was willing to do all of the time. Think about all of us who, who play the piano. Some of us, it was torture to get us to practice. And other people, this is how they calm themselves was by practicing. So you have to love what you do. And then the discipline follows naturally. Amazing advice. Ruth Gotian, thank you so much. She is the author of the new book, The Success Factor. You can check it out at ruthgotian.com. Thank you, Ruth. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Take care and have a good week.